participants to the second session of the Child Labor in Humanitarian Action training package. You can find more information and all the resources on the Child Labor Task Force microsite. My name is Silvia Oñate and I'm the co-lead of the Child Labor Task Force. And today I'll be sharing with you some basic concepts information on Child Labor in Humanitarian Action together with some colleagues. Alison Einan, Child Labor Task Force Consultant, who developed the training package and the Child Labor Toolkit, and also with Domenico De Nuzzo, Child Protection and Emergencies Specialist of Plan International, an active member of the Child Labor Task Force. The session is on the impact of humanitarian crisis and child labor, and it will take around 30 to 40 minutes, and we hope that you can find the content interesting and useful for your work in preventing and responding to child labor and humanitarian action. The session will provide an overview of the impact of humanitarian crisis on child labor and also the impact of child labor on children, families, community and society, all the socio-ecological level. And prior to the joining this session, you should have completed the Child Protection Minimum Standard e-course module on child labor, standard 12. And by the end of the session, you will be able to one, to explain how child labor is impacted by humanitarian crisis of different nature. And two, you will be able to describe the impact of child labor on children and families and the consequences for wider communities and societies. And to start, Dome, how many children are in child labor today? We know that figures have recently been updated, but which of these that we can see on the screen are the correct ones? Well, Sylvia, if I have to pick one, I would say 160 million, but uh, I don't know. So, because all the data looks interesting. So, if I can look about the different uh, information that we have, we can say that in 2020, 160 million of children were found to be in child labor. Unfortunately, this is an increase from the 152 million, which were estimated in 2016. But in 2016, this was a decrease from the 168 million children in child labor, which were estimated in 2012. So for that reason, the main question is, what do the latest global estimates tell us about child labor? Well, the latest global estimates from the beginning of 2020 indicates that there are around 218 million of children who works in any form. If you remember from our first session, this includes all form of acceptable work, child labor, and children in the worst form of child labor. 160 million children are estimated to be in child labor. This accounts for almost one in every 10 children worldwide. Child labor comprises work that children are too young to perform and or work that by its nature or circumstances is likely to harm children's health, safety or morals. So this means that child labor encompasses work performed by children in any type of employment with two important exceptions. Permitted light work for children within the age range specifies for light work. And second, work that is not classified as among the worst forms of child labor, particularly as hazardous work for children above the general minimum working age. Child labor is much more common in rural area. There are like 122.7 million rural children in child labor compared to 37.3 million urban children. Most child labor for boys and girls alike continues to occur in agriculture. This is especially the case among younger children for whom agriculture always serves as an entry point. 79 million of children in child labor are performing hazardous work. Hazardous work by children is often treated as a proxy category for the worst forms of child labor for two reasons. First, reliable national data on the worst force of child labor, other than hazardous work, difficult to find. In example, commercial sexual exploitation. 
A second is children in adults work account for the overwhelming majority of those in the worst forms of child labor. If we look about the COVID-19 crisis, how is making this scenario, we found that the results are even more worrisome with many more children at risk of being punished into, pushed into child labor. But let's look at some of these figures in more detail and what these tell us. Of the 168 million children in child labor at the beginning of 2020, estimates appear to show that boys face a greater risk of child labor than girls, particularly as they get older. However, when household chores performed for 21 hours or more each week are taken into account, the gender gap, the gender gap in child labor narrows. Girls are more commonly involved in domestic work, a form of work that is often not considered in child labor estimates. Domestic work is often hidden and hard to tackle because of its underlying social and cultural norms that regard domestic work as a traditional female role and responsibility. Domestic work takes place in the informal economy and remains largely unregulated, leaving millions of children, particularly girls, invisible in child labor statistics. Globally, Almost half of all children can be found in hazardous child labor, making it by far the most common worst of child labor. These slides highlight the proportion of girls and boys in the hazardous work. Again, this estimate shows boys are more at risk, but we expect that there is a significant underestimation of girls in the worst forms of child labor, as much of their work in domestic labor is unaccounted for taking place in the informal economy, remaining largely unregulated, where they are at serious risks of harmful and abusive conditions. Younger children constitute a smaller but still substantial share of total children in hazardous work, while children of all ages must be protected from hazardous work, its persistence and now growth among younger children is particular concern. Hazardous work constitute a sizable share of child labor among children aged 5 to 14 across all the three sectors. The largest share of child labor takes place within family. Nearly three quarters of child labor takes places within family farms or businesses or in domestic works, where adult works accounts for a substantial portion. This means that most children in child labor are family regulars, as opposed to being informal or paid employment, which is counter to the common perception that families provide a safe working environment. A much lesser number of children are employed in formal or informal work, and even fewer who of their own account or are self-employed. Children's involvement in household chores are not considered in child labor estimates. However, data is gathered alongside child labor to give an accurate picture of the significant double burden girls often bear as they conduct household chores alongside paid work. When we measure household chores, 21 hours a week is considered that the threshold in which they negatively impact education. In 2017, it was found that girls account for two thirds of the 23 million children aged 5, 14 years who perform household chores for at least 21 hours per week. The 22 million who perform score for more than 28 hours per week and of the nearly 7 million performing course of for 43 or more hours each week. Many children undertake both forms of work as part of their daily life. Girls are also much more likely than boys to perform both work in employment and in household course in the same week also referred to as double work duty. The worst forms of child labor, including hazardous work, are prohibited for all children below the age of 18 years and should be eliminated as a matter of urgency. 
slavery and forced labor require special attention. Although exact data is often hard to come by, these worst forms of child labor are thought to affect over 4 million children globally. It includes commercial sexual exploitation, forced and bounded labor, and recruitment into armed force or armed groups. All these forms of child labor that often see an increase in conflict and crisis settings. This extreme form of child labor in which the children suffer both the impact of hazardous working condition and the trauma of coercion, threats of penalty, and lack of freedom requires urgent action from government and the international community. Silvia, do you want to continue? Thank you, Domenico. Thank you for taking us through the global estimates and trends. In the e-module, you have seen how humanitarian crises negatively affect child labor. So now to recap, we know that humanitarian crises one, create new child labor risk factors. So for example, loss of household income, school closures, and disruption of services that create the conditions for child labor to increase. In this type of situations, families can be forced to use child labor as a coping mechanism. Second, humanitarian crisis, we know that exacerbate existing child labor risk factors by increasing the pre-existing forms of child labor. The tasks that children were performing before the crisis may also become more dangerous when children work in new or insecure places. And third, we know that humanitarian crises also change or undermine the child's protective environment. Crisis can lead to the breakdown of family, uh, the support networks, the social safety nets, and disrupt the essential services that help to protect children from child labor. So when child's protective environment is affected, child labor risks can increase. And we have evidence to say that child labor in situations of fragility is three times higher than the world average. So child labor declines as the level of human development increases. And there is a strong correlation between child labor and situations of humanitarian crisis, where a large share of children in child labor live. ILO estimates that the incidence of child labor in countries affected by armed conflict is 77% higher than the global average. And the incidence of hazardous work is 50% higher in countries affected by armed conflict than in the world as a whole. So let's remember that in humanitarian settings, hazardous child labor data is often used as a proxy for all worst forms of child labor because reliable data on other worst forms of child labor is often unavailable. But why to focus on child labor? Alison, can you please tell us more on what is the impact of now of child labor on children? Yes, thanks, Sylvie. So I'm going to run through, um, after seeing the current picture of child labor today, let's remember the impact of child labor on children. These can be both positive and negative aspects to children's work. However, for children in child labor, the impacts are overwhelmingly harmful, physical, psychosocial, and at the educational level. And there also are many negative consequences that for communities and societies if child labor becomes a widespread phenomenon. Children in child labor can be exposed to many different dangers and hazards, and we'll find out about these in the next few slides. If our objective is to reduce the harms that working children face, it is important that we understand these full range of dangers and hazards that children and child labor can be exposed to. By understanding these harmful consequences, we can help identify areas where preventative and risk reduction strategies can be put in place. We can divide them into different categories, but some are very much linked. We're now gonna take a quick look and give some examples of each of these. So biological hazards, maybe things um, like dangerous animals or insects, bacteria and viruses, chemical hazards such as toxic substances and cleaning agents, heavy metals, pesticides and explosives. Ergonomically hazards which force children to carry heavy loads, or work in repetitive movements and awkward positions can be damaging. 
physical hazards such as extreme temperature, noise and radiation, the risk of falling objects, being struck, cut or burned are clearly dangerous for children. Psychological hazards such as stress, intimidation, monotonous work and abuse. And social hazards where children are isolated from their families, their friends, their peers, and they face substance abuse and difficult circumstances. And finally, poor working conditions such as long hours, working nights in isolation or insecure areas. Full lists of all these can be found in the toolkit. So we know that children can be exposed to the same dangers faced by adults in the workplace. However, they, are more, they can be more significantly affected. This is because their bodies are still developing and they have special physical and cognitive and behavioral and emotional characteristics that must be considered. There is a long list of key developmental differences between adults and children, but let's always remember that children are not little adults. To highlight a few examples, children have two and a half times more skin per their body weight than an adult, which along with thinner skin results in greater absorption of toxins. A child breathes more deeply and frequently than an adult, so they take in more pathogens and toxins and pollutants. As they grow, they consume higher levels of energy and water and air, as they, take, and as they take in more, they receive higher doses of whatever diseases and contaminants are present in the environment, the air and water and food that they consume. And metals and diseases and toxic substances are retained in children's brains more readily in childhood and are absorbed at greater rates. They also have unique exposure pathways. They're less able to recognize and assess potential risks at work and make decisions about health and safety. They may be lower to the ground and have greater hand to mouth activity, increasing their exposure. So we'll look at some of the factors which exacerbate children's physical vulnerabilities. And there are a number of these, a lack of work experience and of children's sense of wanting to perform well, to do extra or go that little bit further to please adults affects children's ability to make informed judgments about risk and what is safe to perform and, uh, or to do or not to do. Where adults are not, not, not practicing correct health and safety behaviors from adults, children will learn incorrect practice and unsafe behavior from them. And if they have little or no training and safety induction, children will not know that they are placing themselves in danger or what they should be doing to minimize the hazards. Inadequate and harsh supervision only exacerbates children's behavior towards safety and limited their limited rights and agency and control in the workplace means children are often powerless in terms of organization and their position in the workplace. Some of the physical consequences that children experience can result around physical and sexual but violence and abuse. These can cause short and long-term harm from injuries and significant psychosocial harm, which we will discuss a little bit later on. But the exposure to adult inappropriate adult behavior and settings of the worst forms of child labor, such as sexual exploitation, have higher risks of drug dependency and mental health problems, increased risk of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases, things like unwanted pregnancy and associated risks. While it's difficult to quantify, it is believed the earlier a person starts to work, the more premature the aging that will follow. Of course, there are the more obvious physical consequences, such as illness and injury, impairment, and even death. These, there are specific diseases and illnesses rela related to work, which they carry out, as well as these injuries and impairments. Consequences can be short term, such as cuts and bruises, skin problems, but more significantly long-term health problems which cause harm well into adulthood. Child labor can also exacerbate common diseases because of poor hygiene, poor living and working conditions that many children in child labor are exposed to. As we said earlier, there are significant psychosocial consequences of children's work. The impact can be huge on children. Children when they are in work and they live in a, an environment where they are belittled or harassed or experience psychosocial violence and abuse, this can culminate over time. Children can suffer stigmatization, marginalization and discrimination from their peers. 
and within their communities, particularly if they appear different in appearance or behavior to other children in their communities and schools. Children who work in extremely dangerous situations and in exploitative and abusive conditions where they are abused, degraded and rejected by employers, peers and others, risk psychosocial distress caused by isolation, limited freedom of movement, social integration with others and separation from their primary caregivers who can ensure their welfare and healthy development. Children in these situations may become highly dependent on their employers for their basic needs and have little or no ability and power to escape the maltreatment that they experience. Children's sense of personal security can also be negatively impacted by child labor as their personal identities and value are degraded, affecting how far children are able to shape their futures. This leads to serious emotional expressions, including stress, low self-esteem, helplessness, and sometimes strong or overwhelmingly negative feelings. And we know many forms of child labor actively and physically prevent school attendance. Children may have limited or no time to dedicate to learning, attend classes, or to undertake homework or study. They are likely to perform poorly in school and are more likely to drop out of school at a young age. Once out of school and in child labor, particularly the worst forms of child labor, it can be much more difficult to get children back into school. Children in child labor often face concentration difficulties due to tiredness, hunger or sickness, especially in food insecure and drought areas. Limited availability of catch up, non-formal education or alternative education opportunities who have long or short term education gaps means they may have limited or de delayed development so of cognitive and socio emotional skills without securing basic literacy children are unable to gain certification and the skills required to secure decent work in the future where they are vulnerable and to remaining in low skilled and low paid insecure hazardous conditions trapped in cycles of poverty and exploitation and in communities and societies, the impact of child labor can be damaging and far reaching. Child labor increases the supply of low skilled workers, harming human capital and slowing economic recovery and development. Large informal economies where working children are often found not only affect the ability of governments to collect tax and provide essential public services for everyone, but they reduce decent work opportunities, drive down pay and working conditions and increase competition between adults and children for work. Societies develop where it is cheaper to employ children who can be easily manipulated rather than pay for costly decent work for adults. And of course, the economic investment needed to remove children is high. So without quality and available public services, children and youth are further disadvantaged. Gender inequalities in education and society are negatively impacted and youth unemployment creates long-term intergenerational problems for communities, which are again difficult and costly to solve. So as we mentioned earlier, there can be both positive and negative aspects to children's work. So as we conclude this session, it's important that while for, the major, for children in child labor, the, um, the impact of child labor is overwhelmingly harmful, but the right type of work for children at the right age, in the right conditions can offer positive aspects, which can help children grow and develop as they move from children to productive and happy adults. Acceptable forms of work, which provide safe and age appropriate opportunities to develop skills and knowledge, as well as contribute financially to the individual and family should not be eliminated and include decent work, which is undertaken by children who are above the minimum working age of 15 or 14 years in certain countries. And that is not hazardous or other worse forms of child labor and light work, which is undertaken by children below the minimum age for work, but above the age of 12 or 13 in some countries. And again, which that does not interfere with their health, safety or education. That brings us to the end of this training session. Um, if to continue learning more on child labor and humanitarian action, please listen to the second pre-recorded webinar on preventing and protecting children from child labor and visit the Child Labor Task Force microsite with all the additional resources 
uh, part of the interagency child labor toolkit learning package. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.